Hey, I'm here with uh, Roger Koppel, who um, has written a bunch of things, most notably his most recent book, um, Expert Failure, which is both an investigation as to why it occurs, like what, what the incentives are, and how you might go about correcting it. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Oh, I think so. Uh, there's, there's two things. Uh, you know, I'm an economist, so economists always talk about incentives. I always talk about incentives. But also, it's not quite really the same thing, information flows or knowledge mm. flows. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And insti- yeah, right. So, you know, institutions influence both things, incentives and those knowledge flows. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that is actually, yeah, the, the like information flows, that's incredibly interesting. Um, So you have um in, in the book, book and it's not an idea you developed in the it's not an idea that you came up with for the book i think you have another like work on it but um this idea of uh this concept um information choice theory mm-hmm. yeah that's what i call it yeah mm. so c- could you explain what that is for the audience please uh, sure that's my theory of experts. I guess you could call it an, an economic theory of experts because it comes from a kind of economics foundation. But really, it's just a theory of experts on all fours with like any other theory of experts coming from philosophy or science studies or sociology. Um, so the idea is that a, a, an expert is, is anyone paid for their opinion. That's real important. I'm, I'm getting the information choice theory in just a second. Yeah, that's yeah. real important because if, if we define an expert as like by their expertise, which is pretty much universally mm-hmm. what folks have done, uh, I, I think you just you just can't you just can't you know work your way out of a cul-de-sac or whatever. The right, it's self-referential. Because, well, kind of you know because then I'll, then I have to if 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 if. if if an expert is someone with expertise, well, wait a minute. Mm. We all have a different place in society. We all have a different place in the division of labor. Each of us, therefore, has their own unique place in the division of knowledge, so we're all experts. Well, mm. wait a minute. If everybody's an expert, nobody's an expert. So how can that work, you know, we're doing the intellectual work for me. You know, I'm not, I'm not making progress here. And, and I easily slip into the, to the sort of trap of like trying to figure out like who are the true experts and who are the charlatans, you know, in other words, trying to, right, exactly. You know, that, and, and again, that's kind of a losing game. If I am myself an expert in an area, I may be able to criticize uh, claims that you make based on your expertise. And maybe I'd even be right. Who knows? Right. But that's, that's not a theory of experts. So if you want to have a theory of experts, you got to go to their role in the system. And their role in the system, their contractual rule, they're the ones that are paid for their opinions. So, so, so if that's an expert, then a theory of experts is really all about the choices of experts, what information they choose to convey to others, including, of course, their clients. So it's an information choice theory. Mm. And then the reference is also to so-called public choice theory, mm. the Virginia School of Political Economy sort of critique of, mm. um, of government, of including representative uh, democracy. Mm. Um, you know, now, now, let's be clear, you know, they're supporting, like me, they support representative democracy. They're not like mm. anti-democratic or something, something like that. On the contrary, that the point is to, to make democracy as you know, good as we can make it and stuff. Mm. Um, so that's public choice theory, which has a theory of uh, government failure to, mm. as a sort of dual to the, to the theory of market failure. Well, in that same Virginia school tradition of political economy, I have a, uh, information choice theory, which feeds into supports and gives us a theory of uh, expert failure. Mm. Broadly analogous, you know, to the theory of government failure. How, how does expert failure happen, I guess? Um. <laughs> That's the question. And look, yeah. there's, uh, there's a lot of issues. Um, and, and maybe I'll get to a couple of them. But the, mm. really, the really core, nub, most important takeaway from my point of view mm. uh, is to ask yourself two questions. Who's choosing? Do they have a monopoly? Mm. So, so who's choosing? The expert? Or the non-expert? Is the expert merely advising the non-expert? Or is the expert choosing for the non-expert? So if, if the expert is choosing and not merely advising, that increases the chance of expert failure. 
of the expert somehow failing in their you know responsibility, either giving an untruthful account or uh, failing to uncover appropriate considerations or whatever, somehow coming up short uh, in their advice. The chance of expert failure is greater if, if they're choosing instead of the non-expert choosing. Um, but also, you know, monopoly power matters. If the expert has monopoly power, then the chance of expert failure is greater than if they are in some good, appropriate, real sense competing one against the other. Mm. Now, you know, this poor word competition gets, <laughs> well, it gets a lot of attention in my, yeah, right, you are right to laugh. Right? Because, yeah. So it gets a lot of attention in my book precisely because it means so many different things and stuff. Mm. So um, I always got to flag that. There's no real substitute for it. Mm. But if you have in some sense, as I try as well as I can to kind of articulate in the book, a uh, real rivalrous competition, right? We have free entry mm. where, you know, different um, viewpoints are being represented, where you have heterogeneity of agents, free entry, and some real and, and genuine rivalry. Then uh, that's like, that's kind of the kind of competition I'm talking mm. about. So if you have competitive experts, they're kind of driven to be, you know, teachers and not wizards. So the best thing is if you have competing experts who are merely advisory. Mm. Do you have in Australia consumer reports? Yep. Yeah, okay. So so, uh, so I'm old. I think of that as a magazine, but I guess it's really a website, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so actually, sorry, just funny story, though. No, but, um, please speak. Uh, so like a couple hours ago, um, so I have a – family friend who like recently moved to a new place and they want to set up and set up an internet connection and of course because you know i'm a millennial i've grown up on this stuff uh my parents are like oh you know we'll just go ask you know frank like his opinion and then like you know i'm like i actually don't know how to do this but i do know how to like look up you know comparing rates in the area (laughs) and so yeah um and so that would be you know an example of uh open entry uh advisory expert right yes absolutely per- perfect absolutely perfect that's right um and you know the, the the consumer reports you know i kind of looked a little bit at their at their success rate trying to dig up dirt on the consumer hmm. reports and you almost can't find it i mean they have some mistakes you know but then they get corrected hmm. right away and hmm. and the only if i remember correctly the only mistakes that i found were were sort of the error was on the side of caution for the would-be hmm. reader of consumer reports Right. Rather than like, oh, this toaster is great. And then it blows up on you. It's mm, like, yep. we're not sure about this toaster. And then a week later, they're like, no, no, it's cool. It won't blow up on you. Don't worry. Mm. It's all right. Yep. So so that's consu- so that's a, just a, a success story. Well, of course, you know, they if, if they start giving bad advice, oh, yep. there's there's an infinite, you know, re- current and potential supply of competitors. And then uh, and then, yeah, they're just giving you advice. You don't have to buy the toaster. They tell you to buy. Mm. Then the opposite of that, I call it the rule of experts, is mm. is when you have the monopoly expert deciding for you, and that's like the bad thing. Mm. So that was the you know the old state to pick the most dramatic example that comes easily yeah. to mind. You know, state state supported uh, eugenics programs, right? Yeah, they're gonna the, the state is gonna decide who gets to reproduce and so on. Mm. Um, and and there's no competition for those for those opinions on who's mm. supposedly okay to reproduce. Uh, but even something like, you know, central bank monetary policy, mm. okay? that's in a different category than, than you know, um, genocide, eugenics. But it is in the category. Yeah, right. You know, not the same thing. But it's totally the rule of experts. And um, uh, so that gives you a, a, a good chance of a dreadful, unfortunately, high chance of expert failure, which, in my humble opinion, we have seen. Mm. Particularly, especially like in the U.S., you know, if you look at the history of the Great Depression and everything, uh, I'm convinced by the, the sort of monetarist story that that was really the main driver of, 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 of why that was so bad. I mean, mm. was a failure of monetary policy. And I explained the crisis of uh, 2008 or 2007, depending on sort of how you're counting. Mm. Uh, I, I, I count that as, as an example of uh, failure of monetary policy as well. Mm. I have a, like a little book on that. Yeah, um, I am not qualified to, um, you know, say one way or the other. But uh, following your like formula, I will say that you know you are merely giving advice, and that we can go elsewhere if we need to. So there you go, listeners. Yeah, my friends sometimes like to 
like to, you know, tease me that, well, you're an expert on experts. Yeah. Isn't that embarrassing? And so on. But of course, you just made the right. And I normally just like say, oh, yes, I lose sleep over this. But of course, the, if, if we're going to be serious about the point, uh, mm. you just made it. I, I don't have monopoly power. I am. And I have I have a merely advisory function for my yeah, fellow exactly. economists yeah, yeah. and my fellow citizens of the globe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually, so uh, are you familiar with um, Nassim Taleb's work? Yes, I am. I like Taleb's skepticism quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. But, but I, I think he sometimes views himself as a bit of a seer, and yeah, I'm yeah. not as comfortable with that. <laughs> like his stuff about, like, you know, um, having, like, putting skin in the game for ideas. Um, like, it, what you're saying just seems like a far more fleshed out and, like, rigorous argument for, like, what he's saying. And I think, you know, the fact that you are, like, walking the walk by, I don't know, like, not trying to get a role as, like, some person who, you know, sets policy on experts, um, you know, I, I, I think that's good. And it shows, that, you know, um, you're, like, consistent, which is, is, is very noble. So congratulations. Oh, well, you're wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do try at least to be consistent. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to know because... You know, our models of ourselves are never yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, if 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 I have been consistent, well, that's that's yeah. reassuring. Yeah. So I, I think actually this brings us to the um other thing that I really wanted to talk about with you. Um, why can't we just get a class of people who can you know like sit down and do some equations and like actually be like yeah like this is what you know society should do, like why should we be skeptical of that? Yeah. Um, where do I begin? First, let me calm down. Um, <laughs> but no, of course, of course, you know, the devil's advocate, actually, that's very important, right? Mm. To have the devil's advocate, that's, that's part of Mill's defense of free speech, right? Mm. So even, even if we had a view that somehow we could, like, magically know is right and everything like that, you still need to contrive, construct, and do the best you can to work up the counterarguments so, so that we actually understand the issue and are able thereby to, you know, adhere to whatever the relevant principles are at work so so i'm not really angry and that but now having babbled all that time i've gotten off the thread what's the issue oh why can't we just have yeah yeah just give it to the just give it to the smart people and let them make all the decisions mm. well um i think that was kind of your question right more specifically are there any mathematical reasons why we might, might not want to do that well just first a word on people right i mean yeah. i mean um People are people, and so that's yeah. that's that makes that plan yeah. already uh, yeah. kind of a yeah. non-starter for me. Um, you know, I believe in people, I support people, but you know, people give them power, and then there's danger. Yeah. So my my sort of slogan at the end of my book uh, on experts is uh, value expertise, but to fear mm. expert power. Um, but yeah, then mathematically, I mean, we're inside the world, and then we're trying to model the world. Mm. And so that means we're trying even to model ourselves, uh, which is not somehow like futile or impossible, but the model can't be perfect. Mm. The model can't be predictive. I can't predict, you know, uh, to steal from a Karl Popper here, I mm. can't predict what I'm going to learn tomorrow mm. because if I had tomorrow's knowledge today, it would be today's knowledge, not tomorrow's knowledge. Mm. So if, if you have a system that's learning, if you are learning, then your model must be, it's got to be, it is incomplete. Mm. Um, so then, you know, if I have, you know, the, this, that sort of fantasy of the, you know, the sort of Isaac Asimov fantasy of like the mathematical model that predicts it all and everything, that means there's no learning going on in the system. I've learned everything about the system that mm. there is to learn about the system. So my mathematical model works. But if, if, if I'm in the system, that means there's no more learning for me. And it means that there's no more learning for you either. Mm. Well, I think people do learn. And I, I think that our model of the system has got to be incomplete if we are in the system. So that's, that's, kind, of, um, that's kind of an odd one. That's something that uh, one of my sort of intellectual lights, F.A. Hayek, struggled mm. with. Uh, it's something I'm struggling with right now to really somehow show that that's right. Mm. Um, but I feel quite strongly that it is because 
Right. It, it, it involves us. It involves us in this issue of self-reference. If I'm in the model and I'm modeling, if I'm in the system, pardon me, and I'm modeling the system and I'm modeling myself, that gives us self-reference. Well, self-reference produces all these paradoxes like the, mm. the liar's paradox. Mm. Right? This sentence is a lie. Well, wait a minute. It's a lie if and only if it isn't a lie, right? So, so you get this kind of self-referential paradox when you're modeling yourself. Mm. And the only way out of that self-referential paradox is, is to have the model of yourself to be relatively open-ended. Mm. But then you don't have a closed model. You can't predict the system. So that's kind of the, the, a loose overview of like the mathematics of these issues. Mm. You're probably thinking somewhere in the back of your mind of the, of the famous Gödel's theorem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, where he where he shows. So, so what does Gödel show? Um, well, the way it's usually expressed, they said that if you have a if you have an axiom system rich enough to give you arithmetic, the arithmetic of whole numbers, then you're going to have in this the system theorems that you can state, but you can't prove it, you can't disprove it. Okay? Mm. So that's undecidability. Now, uh, you know, footnote, uh, a guy named Barclay Rosser was the first ver person to prove what I just described. Uh, be be because um, Gödel had to rely on a notion of omega consistency rather than the broader notion of consistency. So there's this little technical detail. Actually, yeah, yeah. The, the first guy to prove Gödel's theorem, as it's usually described, is some guy named Rosser, not Gödel. But, of course, the great pioneer, the great mind, the, the, the wonderful thing worked was done by Kurt Gödel, who deserves every particle of fame he gets for that. Mm. Um, and then and then a guy named Alan Turing, who's now like a sort of a cultural hero, uh, mm. he, he developed the same, essentially the same ideas or similar ideas um, in, in a kind of um, a more definitive form to show that, uh, and, and as Gödel himself noted in 1967, any system, you just can't have a system. That, uh, you know, Gödel's theorem is for systems consist uh, of the sort that Russell and Whitehead in their famous Principia Mathematica book described. Yeah. So there was a certain limit of its application. With Turing, all such limits are off, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, right. So so you you can't have a system uh, that's, that's, you know, rich enough to give you the arithmetic of whole numbers and is fully decidable. doesn't yeah. exist. So anyway, so so that's kind of at, at the root of hmm. all this uh, idea of the, of the difficulty and the problem and the paradox of self-reference. Hmm. Why it is that we can't imagine ourselves to have somehow a computer program, we just put in the current data of hmm. the current system, which is already a challenge. How would you get that data? But hmm. somehow, magically, we supersede that problem. We've got all the data for uh, the whole system right now. We put it into the computer. We turn the crank, and what comes out? Well, the, the computer never never cranks out anything. He can't finish the program. He can't close the model okay? because the computer is in the model. Okay? And um, uh, this, this guttural Turing uh, literature shows why that's a kind of mathematical necessity. I find this sort of thing both really fascinating, but also um, I, I am like vaguely aware of its, of like its history. And I know that it's 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 kind of like quantum mechanics in that you know uh it's been misapplied in a whole bunch of areas to make some really stupid arguments <laughs> yeah. um but yeah. Yeah. um you you so you've um I, I you've got at least one paper i think probably more uh where you talk about like computability economics is that right mm-hmm yeah. Well, well, the loopalized term is computable economics. And yeah. I, I like that a lot. Of the, there are some differences between me and the loopalized. But yeah, his term is computable economics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So like, so, you know, we've like known about this. Um, we've known about like this, you know, uh, uh, feature of mathematics for, boy, like almost a century now. But um, from what I can tell, like it's only really... I don't know, like the eighties, uh, when people started seriously thinking about this, um, and its consequences for like social science. Um, so is that true? First of all, is that true? Or am I just missing? Like there's some people who well, were thinking about this beforehand. 
Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's always been some folks. A guy named Lewis was doing this work early on. It's just beautiful. Hmm. Um, I think it was it was Volupoli who kind of opened the floodgates. And he brought in uh, a guy named um, Francesco Doria. Uh, and he and uh, Newton da Costa did some, hmm. some beautiful work on these kinds of things. Uh, uh, Doria was trained as a physicist. De Costa, I think, was probably trained as a mathematician, but it occurs to me I don't really know. Mm. Anyway, um, and 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 they've they've done a lot of work on on all this kind of issue just in general, mm. and then applied it to the social sciences. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's relatively recent that you get some of this literature that I'm building on. Mm. Um, but you know, the, the pro, but, but again, Lewis and others, you know, early on were worried about this kind of thing. Mm. Um, even if you go back, way back to like the early 30s, right? Mm. So the, the famous Girdle theorem was 1931. Right. And all the way back then, uh, Oscar Morgenstern, the co-founder of game theory, was talking oh. about logistics. So he was very interested in all this uh, formal logic, um, uh, Bertrand Russell, Alfred Whitehead's Principia mm. Mathematica, all that stuff like that. He was real interested in that. Uh, so he was aware of some of these issues. Um, the so-called Austrian School of Economics, mm. the son of the founder, Karl Menger, who's also named Karl Menger, uh, was, was very involved in these kind of issues. Yeah, for, for any uh, of the super nerdy of your of your listeners, mm. the, the correct thing is that the father, it's C-A-R-L, the son, mm. it's K-A-R-L. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, but they're constant, but it's yeah, but it's constantly confused and everything. The father's often given is K-A-R-L. So, mm. so, you know, you just have to look for both. Uh, and they're both wonderful, so they're both worth right. the effort. Um, uh, but anyway, so, so, you know, so we can find stuff going all the way back. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's a relatively recent phenomenon that people have been working up this research program. You can see the problem. If you, if you really take this, this girdle-turing phenomenon seriously, Mm. As Doria and DeCosta want us to do, I mean, it's it's hell on the powerful. Right? <laughs> it's, it's deeply right because 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 it it, it places a fundamental logical limit mm. on what the powerful can know, what they can mm. control, what they can predict. Mm. So it it absolutely decimates their the the epistemic hubris that they must have mm. to defend their position of power. Their, mm. their, their right uh, and their power, indeed, to choose for you. Mm. So, so if, and, and in economics, man, you know, all the big prizes are actually outside of the university. Mm. You want to be, you know, chairman of the Federal Reserve. You want to mm. be, you know, vice president of the World Bank and so on. So there's these big pride, or you know, uh, chief economic advisor to the president. You know, so there's yes. these th there's this institutional power structure mm. in one's nation, and indeed in the globe with these you know mm. transnational organizations like the World Bank, mm. um, uh, and that's where the big prizes are. Yep. So if if right, so so what kind of economics helps me? to compete for those prizes. Not an economics that says, well, we can't really know what's going on, prediction is mm. tough, self-reference makes uh, a complete model of ourselves impossible. Here we are inside the system, mm. so we can't model it as we could if we were outside the system. The universe you know, processes information faster than any computer inside the universe. These kind of results um, are, are antithetical. Mm. To this, you know, sort of these power relationships. Yep. Yep. Which which your model predicts. So that's a point in your favor. <laughs> I like to think so. I like to think so. I, of course, I'm convinced. That's why I'm saying oh. all these things. Yeah. I'm true. True. Uh, yes. I uh, you know, get a second if, opinion. If we're, if, if we're self consistent. Right, exactly. For self-consistent fallibilists, we have to we have to at least try. To, we have to at least pretend, mm. right? Even if you can't do it in your soul, you have to at least take the public posture that well, I could be mistaken. Let's hear the other points of view. Let me mm. consider your, yeah. you know, and that's good enough, actually, right? Humans are fallible, so we should really be genuinely humble. Uh, 
But, you know, right down the line, well, you know, Ben Franklin talked about this in his famous autobiography. He says, well, I never, I never achieved much in the way of substance on humility. Mm. But I learned how to fake it real good, and that served <laughs> me well. So he, like, freely admits, oh, yeah, you know, just my vanity just wouldn't allow me to adopt this sure. virtue of humility. Huh. But, you know, it's still a virtue. It's a fault of mine that I couldn't actually be humble. And it was it was a great, you know, aid to me to fake it. In a way, admitting that is like a like a way of expressing humility, though, right? Like, you know, yes. if, if, he, if he was to be like, oh, but I'm actually the most humble that would be the that'd be worse. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, of course, of course, right. In yeah. fact, in fact, Franklin makes the the point. He says he says at certain places, you know, I've never heard the world the words I may say without vanity, but some vain thing immediately follows. Exactly. So, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. These these insights, if true, um, it doesn't mean you know we're like in this. To, like it doesn't mean we have no like sense of direction right like we like you, you you we can still like you know try to make models of things right it just says there are like fundamental limits yeah w one of the greatest thinkers on this kind of topic um was was again this guy f.a hayek h-a-y-e-k mm. yeah. um and and he he carved out uh, sorry, let me give a little ad for this book of his that's underappreciated because he's mostly famous as being an economist. He got a Nobel mm. Prize in economics. But, but actually, he published this crazy, wonderful, beautiful book in 1952, The Sensory Order, hmm. which was based on some student notes he had written out in 1920, before he had his economics training, before he became came under the influence of his sort of great economics mentor, a guy named Ludwig von Mises. Yeah. Um, so he's working out in 1952 these early ideas, uh, and in working them out, he clarified what he calls uh, the, the principle of the explanation of the principle. So, you know, I might be able to work out sort of the principles of how the mind works, and they might even be kind in some sense, at least when you look at the principles one by one, they might seem to be kind of mechanistic. But, but if, if in their combination, they generate a level of complexity that's greater mm. than I can model in my head. Okay, well, then for me, it's going to look like learning and all sorts. Of, it's going to look not mechanistic to me. Mm. So I can have an explanation of the principle. I can also have, I can also have, and another important concept that Hayek worked out, I can also have pattern prediction. I may be able to predict the general pattern of events if we have, you know, so, something that looks more or less like a free market versus something that looks more or less mm. like some sort of command and control system. Mm. Uh, again, these are dangerous words because it gets into different meanings yeah, yeah. and stuff. But, you know, yeah. I, can, I, can, I can map out you know, these kind of alternatives and I might be able to make a, a pattern prediction, okay? mm. but I'm not going to be able to predict the, you know, the precise mm. course of events. So Hayek did a lot of, of really hard cognitive work and laying all that out. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if I was to try and conceptualize the difference, it'd be like uh, distinguishing between like tendencies and laws, maybe. Yeah, we do pretty good on tendencies. Laws, you know, well, what do you mean by law? But yeah, we t uh, our theorems are all, you know, uh, Dan Klein talks about this. Our theorems in, in the social sciences are all sort of, well, in the main, for the most part, in general, uh, right, which is a tendencies argument, mm. right, rather than, you know, billiard balls, you know, t taking predetermined courses. Yeah. Yes, yes. You do not have the majesty of physics, unfortunately. Yeah, although although even physics bumps into these sorts of things. You mentioned quantum mechanics. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of a closed book to me. But yeah. but but apparently apparently in quantum mechanics, you know, they have these ideas of like the wave function collapses mm. when the particle is observed, stuff mm. like that. So 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 already with quantum mechanics, which is kind of a classical world in certain mm. uh, aspects of this like basic logical architecture but even in quantum mechanics the physicist is somehow inside the system mm. yeah and so things start to things start to get weird right um 
And then if you move on to something like biology or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. things get, you know, sort of weird, weirder still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 In fact, part of the thing with like Stu Kaufman's work, and, mm. and including the work that Stu and I are trying to do together, uh, is exactly as we move from sort of, you know, um, mm. Newtonian mechanics to quantum theory to biology to the mm. social sciences, these kind of problems of of learning, of open-endedness, mm. of self-reference, of what you can infer from inside the system versus what you can infer from outside the system, all that sort of stuff gets sort of bigger and bigger problem, mm. a greater and greater limit as you move from basic, you know, Newtonian mechanics of the sort you need to know how to build like a bridge or something mm. to the social sciences. Mm. So these problems just grow in size and importance. Uh, which again, good old Hayek, you know, he was he was there on so much of this stuff. Mm. Uh, uh, that's why you know Hayek uh, insisted that um, the, the, one of the key things about social sciences is is this com- issue of complexity. It's just an order of magnitude more complex than what we generally call physics. Mm. So you know what science looks like suddenly changes when we get to mm. this kind of uh, area. But a lot of this complexity is, 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 is working has worked its way back down to physics. Mm. Some people in my audience might be familiar with um, Stuart Kaufman's work, but um, I'm going to assume most aren't. So could you like, he's done like a lot of stuff. Um, just go look at his Wikipedia page. But uh, could you kind of like summarize what you two are trying to do together? Oh, gosh, you know, I'm not sure I can. I'll do my best. Uh, so Stuart Kaufman, <laughs> Stuart Kaufman was originally trained as a, as a, as a doctor, as a medical doctor, and he practiced yeah. for a while. Uh, but then he was sort of driven back into academic stuff. He has, you know, he's one of the great minds of our times. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a very important mind. Um, and he, he kind of got known as a biologist. So sometimes he's, he's classified as a biologist. Done, did done important theoretical work. Um, in biology, and one of the one of the you know deep insights he had was that we get order for free. Mm. So so you have a system, right? So so in physics, right? You have a system. There's like particles in motion, you know, um, and so the, you, you're going to go to a low um, a, 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 a low order state in that system. Mm. So that's the so-called second law of thermodynamics. Yep. So everything's just going to kind of dissipate. Sometimes people use the term heat death, right? Mm-hmm. So, so order is just it's, it's going to fall apart because it takes work to keep an order together. Um, but, but Stu has shown that actually you can get, even with just like molecules, right? So we don't have to have like anything that looks like life, you know? But anyway, mm-hmm. we can have these systems of agents, even if the agents are just like molecules, that are, are sort of fitting together to form a structure that then leads to another structure, that then leads to another structure, that then leads to the first structure back again, mm. right? You can have these sort of self-constructing uh, systems. Now, you know, if, if we had an infinite number of particles and their initial interactions were random, so any one particle might interact with any other particle with the same probability, and there's no structural nature to the particles, they're just little dots, uh, then we don't have any toothing stones. We don't have anything to grab out, no hooks to Mm. cause this kind of combination to happen. But if you look in the world, no, I mean, molecules have, you know, uh, the, the different, you know, uh, valences of attraction and repulsion between them and so on. So there's plenty of hooks mm. for the particles to, to have this kind of um, uh, interactions that allows for self-constructing orders. Mm. And this is very important for something like, you know, Darwinism. For a while, Stu was getting construed falsely, mistakenly, getting construed as anti-Darwinist. Hmm. Uh, because he was engaging he was engaging the problem that in, in the amount of biological time that we've had for this complicated biosphere to, to emerge, I mean, ha- have, we, ha- have, the, have the Darwinian mechanisms as traditionally construed mm. really had enough time to produce that much order? Okay. That was really a, a, a serious, and is a serious 
question, to which one might plausibly say, no, nah, it doesn't seem like that's enough time. Well, Stu showed that if you get, quote unquote, order for free in the sense mm. I just described, oh, okay, then we have had enough time. Right? It, uh, if these so-called autocatalytic sets are, are a characteristic feature of the world, mm. then, um, yeah, then, yeah, we've actually had plenty of time for this kind of order to emerge. So what, what Stu and I are now doing is a couple of things. Um, for, for one thing, we're, we're showing that these autocatalytic sets apply to social science as well as to the, to the biological sciences. Mm. Right. And then Stu has, has kind of rediscovered actually a principle that, that I learned from uh, Mario Rizzo and Jerry O'Driscoll at NYU many years ago, uh, the, un, the listability problem. Which mm. the famous GLS Shackle also made a big deal out of. One of my teachers, Ludwig Lachman, made a big deal out of it. We can't, you know, list all the possibilities. So Stu's example, he asks, uh, uh, "How many? What? You know, list for me, please, the uses of a screwdriver." Well, you know, you can't. Right? Mm. Um, it's, it's an in, right, it's an in, okay. But but if I can't list, sort of list out all the possibilities for the system, I can't have a complete and closed model for the system. If I have, and now go back to the earliest work that I did with Stu. If we have an, uh, uh, an evolutionary system, then what I can't then, um, the, the so-called phase space, right, of mm -hmm. possibilities is, is itself evolving. So what does that mean? Well, look, if I do like a physics model, like something might you learn in you know, freshman physics or something like that, uh, then I have a space. It might be like physical space or, you know, might be some combination of temperature and pressure for a gas or whatever. But anyway, I've got a space of, pro of possibilities, okay? And then I've got some equations for how the entities in my uh, system behave, how molecules bounce off each other, the ideal gas law or whatever it is, okay? So I got a mathematical, you know, description of the whole space of possibilities, I got some rules for how stuff interacts, so those become so-called laws of motion. So if I just had all the information of how the system is at, is is in the beginning, what the disposition of each particle is and stuff, in the beginning, and I have my laws of motion, I turn the crank, I have the whole future history of that system, at least up to a random error term. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's kind of how we think, that's kind of how we do science. Well, wait a minute, if I have an evolutionary system, that doesn't really work. Because at the, at the level of description that we need to do to describe, for example, biological evolution, the, the space of possibilities has to include things like, you know, eyes and purposes and other stuff like that that don't show up in that physics textbook. Well, those, those dimensions of the phase space, they're emergent. I can't predict them ahead of time. Okay. Well, wait a minute. If I can't, if I can't even describe the space ahead of time, the space of possibilities, the so-called phase space, okay, then I can't have so-called laws of motion mm. that are going to tell me where the system's going. Right. I'm going to have to learn about the system as the system evolves. And, and uh, so if that's, if that's the world we're in, then our whole way how we like to do models in science in general, including the social sciences, is uh, maybe uh, it's not thrown out the window. We never can do that again. But it, it's way more limited its applications mm. than we might have ever have thought. Okay? Mm. I can't. I can't. You know. Not only can't I tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. I can't tell you what what the possibilities are. What's possible to happen tomorrow? Mm. Okay? So that's the way just evolutionary systems are in biology, and therefore also in the social sciences. So that suddenly leads you to a whole different way how you got to approach the stuff. Mm. You know, you got to have novelty generation in your model. You've got to have creative evolution, to borrow a term from Henri Bergson. Bergson. Mm. Uh, you got to have creative evolution in your system, and that's mm. just not how we do, you know, traditional mainstream economics mm. or social. Uh, it's not how we do traditional mainstream economics. Uh, and again, this whole open-ended vision, it's real bad if what your goal is, is to have like good monetary mm. policy, mm. to direct monetary policy for the federal, mm. uh, for the central bank of your, of your national government or something like that. Mm. Right? Again, it's kind of a um, uh, debunking sort of, a, it's, not, it's not intended as a debunking exercise, but it has this kind of debunking effect. 
uh, of saying, well, wait a minute, you know, the, not only is the system not predictable, it's just got to be in order for you, you know, experts to run the system. Mm. Even the possibilities are not predictable. Mm. Yep. There's things to learn about it. If we can't know ahead of time, like at the bare minimum, that should mean considerably more decentralization uh, than we have now. Uh, would would that be correct? That's where I go. I, I go toward, you know, old, in the old-fashioned sense, I go toward liberalism, toward what a lot of us are now calling uh, cosmopolitan liberalism. Cosmopolitan because, like, um, you know, maybe we need, like, nations or whatever, but, you know, I am first a human on the globe and only mm-hmm. secondly, say, an American citizen. So in that sense, you know, instead of being prizing my own sort of geopolitical space, you know, or region or country or whatever above others, mm. I take a more cosmopolitan view. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm driven to cosmopolitan liberalism. Mm. Now, we, now we have to be we have to be smart though. I think you used the word decentralization. Mm. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but wait a minute, D- details matter. Mm. Uh, if things are all open-ended and all stuff like that, like we've just been saying, if we have to learn, as we've just been saying, then it's unlikely that any short algorithm of mm-hmm. like, well, you know, have these mm-hmm. these five rights written into a constitution and have, mm-hmm. you know, this level of political right, that, that any short algorithm for decentralization and human mm-hmm. rights and stuff is going to work. And, and I'll give you an example. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I mean, the civil rights movement of the 60s in the United States, right? The the federal government really did kind of need to take over certain functions that in a different context, you might have said, no, that should be local. That should be local. Yeah, except the local authorities were oppressing black folks, mm. you know, both informally and informally. So you needed federal intervention if we were going to end that, you know, violent and both violent and coercive oppression of black folks. Mm. Um so that's what the, that's part of what the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a very famous piece of legislation here in the U.S. That's kind of part of what that was was all about. So you so you could no longer because of federal law, you could no longer put out a, a sign preventing you know saying that black folks aren't allowed in mm. uh, to this business. You couldn't do that anymore. Um, now you know, uh, and then importantly, importantly, if you're a business in the old South and you wanted to have an open door for for people of all colors and ethnicities. Uh, yeah, but wait a minute, because the the local sheriff might, you know, assist in the torching of your business if you have, you know, right. So 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 you couldn't do mm-hmm. that because of the the the, the oppre- structures of oppression that existed at the local level there. Mm-hmm. So when the federal government comes in and says, "Oh, it's a violation of federal civil rights law to exclude black people from your from your restaurant," okay, mm-hmm. then suddenly I, the entrepreneur, am like free to serve black and white people alike. Right, it's a great liberation, actually. Mm. So, so this little story that I've probably gone on too much of length on. Sorry about that. But anyway, mm. that that example shows us that a principle like decentralization, as good as it is, mm. okay, mustn't be applied with a kind of wooden rigidity. Mm. Yeah, we've 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 got we've right. We've got to pay attention to what the current situation yeah, is yeah. we never had uh, I, i'm 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 not myself an anarchist i think mm. you frank are you an anarchist i think you might yes, be aren't you? didn't but, you tell me you yeah yeah, um, yeah so 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 but we never so let me let me just for the moment take on mm. that you know sort of anarchist libertarian view mm. okay but we never had the anarchist libertarian you know perfect mm. system like mm. maybe we should have ought, ought to have had okay uh uh so so, so how do we get our current system yeah. to move toward something more like that? Oh, yeah, okay. You have to you have to open your eyes, pay attention, see what the particulars yeah. are. So, in the, again, in this example from the 1964 civil rights legislation, hmm. maybe something that on the most fair principles you wouldn't have wanted to do, give hmm. power to the federal government, maybe is actually the liberty improving move. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I am. I, I think that the world is incredibly complex and that, you know, you are going to have to make pragmatic uh, concessions to that. Um, 
and you know, well, you know like, the, the institutions didn't have a chance to evolve. So like yeah. like medical licensing, I, I think we can repeal the medical licensing relatively straightforward if only there was a political. But you can't just say okay, every, anything goes right. You have to figure out how to unwind it because what we didn't have was the the evolution of market institutions that reassure the consumer who's a good doctor, who's a bad doctor. So uh, so we're in the desert instead of the forest. Yep. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, no. There's this. Um, there's. So you probably know about um, Yanir Yanir Bayam. Um, he's a New England Complex in- Complex Systems Institute. Oh yes. Yeah. So he 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 actually has a paper on um, he has a paper on like violent revolution and social change, and um, he makes the point that uh like just statistically speaking like violent revolution tends to result uh far more often in autocracies rather than more open forms of government yeah. and his argument basically is yeah. like you know open more open forms of government are better on all these metrics but um like they're more complex and so they take l- more time to build and in the middle of like a violent revolution you don't have that time um, and I, 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 I take that incredibly mm-hmm. seriously. Um, and yeah. yeah. No, that's, that sounds like a right analysis as I hear you explain it. Yeah. Yeah. That seems right. And that's, that's kind of along the lines I was just saying. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, my friend Pete Butkey at George Mason university insists mm. on, uh, the idea of anarchism as a research program. Mm. And um, I think there's great strength in that. I, I was going to bring up actually um, James C. Scott's stuff, uh, which seems really, really, yeah. really close to what um, you're talking about with like you know, uh, like dis, um, you know, disenchanting the notion of like elite uh, decision makers. Um, you you're probably thinking at least in part of his uh, seeing like a state, and yeah. Yeah, that's a just a it's it's a beautiful work. All this stuff you're talking about could be like, if he ever does like a second edition, it it deserves to be in there. Damn it! <laughs> well, thank you for that. I would be honored if that were to happen. Yeah. yeah, I think I think you know that seeing like estate stuff and what what I'm trying to do, particularly mm-hmm. include and including my stuff with uh, Abby and Stu Kaufman, mm-hmm. Abby Devereaux and Stu Kaufman. Yeah, I yeah. think it fits super well with that seeing like estate framework it's a beautiful book i was actually gonna say all this like uh monopoly expertise all of this is only a problem if you actually care about other people if if you're just like (laughs) if you're just like an openly authoritarian and you know you're like yeah i just have this vision of what life should be like and like i don't actually care what the people who have to live with it uh actually go through these objections they sort of matter in that the system has to interface with reality. And so, you know, it needs to be like stable in that way. If you just want to maintain a regime of power for the sake of maintaining a regime of power, it doesn't matter that people are getting, you know, screwed because of your like poor decisions that are derived from complicated mathematical insights. You you can kind of just like shrug your shoulders at that and be like, yeah, but you know, like good for their essential nature or whatever, that's a price to pay. That's not, you know, an objection, but I think it's worth noting that, like, for some people, the fact that they, there is no, like, you can't have, like, actual consistent experts who can, like, properly manage complex systems. I think there are some people out there who would sincerely just be like, yeah, but I don't care. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of the old, you know, act in line that uh, power yeah. tends to corrupt, absolute power tends to corrupt, absolutely. Um, but, but the thing is, in the modern world, power is no longer um, as, as secure as it was mm. before, before the Industrial Revolution. I mean, think of the Soviet Union. Mm. So, I mean, it was terrible. It was, you know, lots of violent oppression, authoritarian indeed totalitarian regime and so on and so on and so on. It was awful. But it fell apart. It couldn't, you know, persist. 
Uh, so and it, it lasted, well, it depends on how you count and everything, but give it, call it, say, 70 years, mm. right? Uh, it, 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 in, a, in, a, in a time when many, many people live more than 70 years, right? So not even mm. a full lifespan. One human lifespan was covered by this period of Soviet, uh, by the Soviet period. So, um, you know, in, in, in loose uh, lingo, you know, markets work, mm. command and control doesn't. So um, I'm a I'm an optimist for the long run, right? As 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 mm. dark as a vision as I accept of the, of the human nature. You were just saying, you know, yeah, people like power. Mm. You know, Adam Smith spoke of uh, the love of domination and tyrannizing. Yeah, that's in us. It's terrible. Mm. Uh, watch out. Maybe it's in me. Watch out. Maybe it's in you. Um, that's just in the human beast. Mm. Uh, but uh, after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the world changed, where the mm. you know the, the the productive the productive thing is is free exchange, decentralized decision making. Mm. Authority is is unproductive. Mm. So 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 the, the way that things actually worked in the old Soviet Union was through su- markets. They were mm. still markets. They were kind of suppressed yep. and controlled yep. and stuff. Yep. But there was still market. Same thing in, in, in North Korea. How they actually eat in oh, North yeah. Korea is through is through the black markets. In fact, the black markets have become sort of charcoal gray, you know, and some of them gray and some of them, all, you know, off-white. And, you know, th- that's how they actually live. Mm. Um, and and I, I have some optimism that mm. uh, Korea may open up soon. You know, all yeah. this, uh, you know, back and forth with uh, Kim, the current leader, uh, was it Kim Il Sung now? I think is the Kim Kim Jong Il. Pardon me, the current leader. Um, you know, it, it it seems like he's trying to figure out how to open up mm. without you know just busting the system apart and ruining everything mm. for the elites. How's he going to do that? Mm. Um, but it does. You know, my vibe from very far away is that they're, they're trying to open up the system because it's mm. not working anymore. So um, in the long run. You know, a tyranny is always a threat. Tyranny is bad. Tyranny is with us. But in the long run, I think free exchange is the winner. And and I'm, mm. I'm optimistic in the long run. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see it actually more as sort of two general strategies. There's like the more centralized, simple one, which is, you know, effective in a small number of domains. And it also is most effective at the beginning for a variety of reasons that I think have to do with processing information. And then there's the more decentralized one, which, you know, in certain domains is like inefficient quote unquote, uh, but, uh, and, and, and like, and has, and takes longer to like build up. But once it is, once it has built up, it's like over a variety of domains, it can like perform quite, quite well, uh and like it it doesn't win by like you know direct confrontation it wins more by like eroding um around the edges and like finding avenues uh that like you know the uh other system like never even dreamed of that it could exploit i am um, uh like for example <laughs> i'm currently uh I, I'm currently like looking into the um, the history of like left wing movements in the um, 20th century. Uh, one of my sources is this pretty good book called um, "Forging Democracy" um, by I think Jeff Eloy. Anyway, they they have like a chapter in there about like popular culture and about how like one reason that the socialist parties that you know were these massive things. Uh, one reason they fell apart was like their vision of like popular culture was this sort of very austere, very like collectivist uh, yeah. vision where like, you know, these like socialists would get together and they'd do like, you know, these coordinated dances and stuff. But then, you know, the capitalist culture was like, yeah. you know, like movies and like, you know, pretty dresses and all this other stuff. And like, you know, this came along and all these socialists, they just didn't know what to do with it. And, and like, I think, I think in like, and that actually goes to your point about like, you know, you can't like list the, uh, like the uses of something or you can't like state the phase space of something. 
you know, like Marxism had these pretense, of course, you know, being in the social sciences of like being, you know, like this complete theory of everything. And then, you know, like all these different things came along that it never foresaw and just completely like obliter- obliterated it. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that so much, you know, the, like our, the, the secret weapon of, you know, um, uh, the forces mm. of liberalism is yeah, like yeah. Hollywood and the, the awesome yeah. movies and, and stuff that, you know, in, the, in an earlier age, I used to speak of, you know, designer genes. There was a time when that was, you know, and, and, the, and the, right. So, so the people who were sweating, uh, you know, I don't know what, you know, I think there's greater liberalism in mm. Iran today than there was when I was younger. Although, of course, you know, the mullahs are still running stuff. But anyway, in an earlier epic, you know, the, the, the people of Iran, they yeah. wanted those designer yeah, genes. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind yeah. of the secret weapon of, of, of the West. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I quite agree with that. I think that's, I think that's so right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, an even more topical example is I think um, uh, Kim Jong-il uh, recently came out saying that, like, he wanted to ban K-pop in uh, North Korea. Uh, both like the music but also like the hairstyles um, because you know he saw it as a subversion yeah yeah great example uh, yeah I, I, I didn't cobble on to that story mm. that's wonderful uh, but although I did see that he's got this list of like what haircuts are acceptable in North Korea yeah yeah so I didn't realize that was a reaction to K-pop that's great yeah that's a beautiful example I, I, I'm, I'm gonna steal that I love that any, anything else? Thank this you. has been wonderful. It's been a great conversation. I, I appreciate, you know, the yeah. interest and attention. Um, this is great. Onward and upward. You know, it's it's persuasion is a long run process. So when we talk about some of these ideas, it can be sometimes uh, yeah. frustrating because they don't just go across and and, and hit their target yeah, yeah, yeah. stick right away. Uh, but in the long run, I think yeah. the truth has power. In the long run, I think. You know, freedom, you know, works and has and, and will prevail. So, you know, be, be yep. of good cheer. Yep. Hang Just, in. I th- think things are going to work in, in the end yep. in the liberal yep. direction. Yep. Society advances uh, one death of an economist at a time. <laughs> As an economist, I have mixed feelings about oh, well. that statement you just made. <laughs> at least, at least you know, give your death meaning. <laughs> no, that's charming. That's great. All right, I'll end it on that. <laughs> <laughs>